Well, also with Ayanichi, Throysa Kanesichi Darkwelchi, good evening, great to see you. A warm welcome to the Cardiff Community uh, Research Showcase and Discussion uh, wherever you are. My name is Professor Damien Walford Davis, I'm Deputy Vice Chancellor at Cardiff University, and you're here this evening as part of a very broad Cardiff community, including alumni, staff, donors, and friends, all of whom are supporting the university. Just to say some housekeeping, uh, tonight's events will be recorded. And as we always say, you will receive the link afterwards and you're very welcome to, to share that link with others as you wish. Well, Tluvan Sigenoni Hena, Yemlagiam Hwil, Aki the Jawefeth Glir, Amid Amhwil Anker, Ak and a Devodolini, Maurabithio, Trinieth, and Agastal, Iganker. And uh, this evening we're showcasing one of our very exciting cancer research programs with Dr. Catherine Hogan, lecturer in the School of Biosciences, and one of our PhD students, Josh D'Ambrogio. Both are based in the European Cancer Stem Cell Research Institute here. And they'll be sharing their insights tonight into how cells function and of course, malfunction when cancer cells form. And with a better understanding of uh, how our cells work at a molecular level, uh, what we're hoping to do is provide the foundation for better diagnostics, better treatments in the short to medium term, and of course, taking steps towards cures in the longer term. And we'll talk about that timeline um, as part of this evening's discussion. So before I invite Catherine and Josh to talk, if you allow me, I want to say uh, something about the context of their research within the vibrant research community and environment at Cardiff. Important to get that context clear. Mar, mar figure and sobrevial, the statistics around cancer, as we all know, so many of us are touched by it, are very, very stark. In the UK, and these were shocking figures for me, uh, a thousand new cases are diagnosed every day, and one in two people will be diagnosed with some form of cancer in their lifetime. Cancer research um, is part of our Cardiff um, focus. Um, it's one of our principal biomedical themes and the shape um, of our research and our interventions at Cardiff take in cancer genetics, tumor development, right through, and it's often a necessarily long journey to new drug discovery and clinical trials. We all know cancer research is a complex challenge and it requires a complex of world leading facilities and equipment, technologies, techniques, and of course, people. We work with others, clearly. Cardiff and Vale University Health Board are key, as is the Belindre University Trust. That's an NHS trust um, that is a specialist provider of cancer services in Wales. And in Partnering with those kinds of entities, we bring together clinicians and academics, and we also collaborate, of course, with other research groups and clinical teams, not just in the UK, but globally. And supporting and nurturing emerging talent in the field here at Cardiff is absolutely crucial. So researchers like Catherine and Josh are the pioneers that will drive forward future breakthroughs. Um, finally, our PhD studentships are supported, and we need to acknowledge this by a plethora of funders and funding bodies. And I'm delighted that this evening's work showcases uh, PhD research on pancreatic cancer, supported by the Wales-based charity Amser Just In Time. Okay, we've received some questions in advance, and I may start with those after the presentation, but if you do have any questions following the presentation that you'd like answers to, please enter them in the Q&A box. And that's right at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will answer as many as time permits. And those we won't get to, we will also get back to you on. And Gadini Gachwin and Oswath, I'm delighted to ask Josh and Catherine to present Croeso Chirchdai. Welcome both, Catherine and Josh.
Good evening. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I'm Catherine and this is Josh. We're going to give you an oversight of our, our an overview of our uh, research program here at Cardiff University, where we're studying uh, pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer is an incredibly lethal form of cancer. It's the 10th most common form of cancer in the UK, but it's the fifth most common form of cancer related death in the UK. This is in large part down to its symptomless nature in early stages, which makes early diagnosis incredibly difficult. The majority of cases are diagnosed at stage three or stage four, which are considered to be advanced stages. Furthermore, nearly half of all cases are diagnosed in emergency settings, for, for example, A&E. And this contributes to a uh, very poor five-year survival rate for the disease of approximately 5%. Obesity is the most major modifiable risk factor for pancreatic cancer and increases risk in approximately 12% of all cases. Obesity is a very serious health crisis in its own right. Uh, obesity in, uh, and being considered obese is measured as having a BMI or a body mass index of 30 or above. Uh, 30 uh, kilogram per meter squared or above. You are considered overweight if you have a BMI between 25 and 30. In the last 30 years, BMI in both males and females have increased uh, quite significantly, a study by Public Health England observed. A House of Commons survey in 2022 observed that in the population that's 25 and above, over half is considered to be overweight or obese. In Wales specifically, a Welsh Parliament study in 2014 observed that over half of the adult population is considered overweight or obese, uh, and over a quarter of the child population is considered overweight or obese. So the pancreas is a very, very crucial organ it's located between the spleen and the intestines and plays a crucial role in um, digestion and uh, blue gl blood glucose uh, maintenance. Uh, it has two functionally distinct regions. The exocrine region uh, is crucial for uh, creating digestive enzymes that then travel to the stomach to break down foods. Uh, and it has the endocrine region, which is a uh, it is uh, necessary for maintaining blood glucose levels through the uh, creation of uh, the hormones insulin and glucagon. In our research, we're interested in understanding how does pancreatic cancer start in a tissue in an adult. And by understanding the early stages of tumor genesis, we have a better uh, insight into the biology and this could lead to early detection. So in general, we know that cancer is a disease caused by changes in gene expression. So our genes are instructions carried in our DNA that lead to the production of proteins, which are the building blocks of our cells. And the cells are the building blocks of our tissues. As we age, our DNA instructions become prone to error, and this leads to the accumulation of what we call mutations in our, in, in our genes. Many genetic mutations are harmless to our bodies and our cells, but some genes are cancer-causing once they become mutated. And when cells carry cancer-causing genetic mutations, they become what we call transformed. And this means that they change their cellular behavior and their cell responses, and they're no longer responsive to the external signals that are coming from the tissue. And that means that they're no longer able to be regulated. In pancreatic cancer, a key genetic mutation happens in a gene called RAS. RAS encodes for a family of proteins of molecular switches, and they behave like switches in the cells. So they switch between an active a state, which is GTP bound, and an inactive or off state GDP bound. And in general, in our cells, we need RAS proteins because RAS controls many functions in the cell. So it tells cells when to grow, when to divide, when to die, and so on. But when the gene for RAS becomes mutated, 
then the protein stays in this on state permanently and it can't switch back to the off state. And this means that uh, the cells now become uncontrolled. So they have uncontrolled growth, they divide uncontrollably, they no longer are uh, responsive to cues to die, etc. And all of these features underline the development of cancer. We know that RAS mutations are associated with at, at least a third of all human cancers, but they are the key driving mutations, what we call driver mutations, the key cancer causing mutations in pancreatic cancer. And they're detected in 90% of human tumors. And we know from experimental research that RAS proteins, once they're mutated, are absolutely crucial for the growth of the tumor. So the pancreas, like all of our, our tissues and organs in our body, are very finely tuned environments. They're really, all of the cells are under very tight and strict controls. And this ensures that disease doesn't happen very often. Pancreatic cancer starts primarily in adulthood. It's an adult disease. And it starts when some cells take on mutations in this protein or this gene, RAS. So it happens spontaneously or what we call sporadically when a few cells take on this genetic mutation. So what, what, we, what we are interested in understanding is how do these cells then grow and develop to form a tumor if they're surrounded by an environment that's still under this very tight control. To be able to do this, we take advantage of technology um, that involves fluorescence imaging. And we use uh, proteins that have been engineered from proteins that exist in nature. So for example, the jellyfish in the deep sea use fluorescence proteins as guidance cues or, or signals in, in the sea. And we can harness that technology and use it as an engineering tool in the lab. What this allows us to do then is to tag our genetically mutant cells with these fluorescent reporters. And this has two advantages. Firstly, it allows us to identify which cells have taken on this RAS mutation. And secondly, it allows us to trace these cells in the tissues over time, and it allows us to study their behavior while they're surrounded by non-mutated or healthy cells. So using this system and using several different tissue systems that model the pancreas, um, as well as disease models, what we've been able to show is that when RAS, cells that carry RAS mutations are surrounded by healthy cells, then they always uh, take on this specific phenotype. And this phenotype is that the cells lose their ability to have space in the tissue. They become very round, they detach from the underlying uh, substratum, and they're ultimately kicked out of the tissue. And this happens in all of the systems we've tested. We've also shown that this is evolutionary conserved, which suggests that it could be an ancient system that is very important to health. So ultimately what we've discovered is that when RAS mutant cells are in the presence of normal healthy cells, they have to compete to be able to stay in the tissue and survive. And this competition ultimately means that they are kicked out as loser cells. We've also been able to show that this is conserved in the pancreas itself. So if we model early pancreatic cancer by turning on RAS mutations in small numbers of cells with, when they're surrounded by uh, healthy cells, what we found is that this competition process occurs and the competition process occurs so that the RAS cells are eliminated as loser cells. So cell competition keeps the tissues healthy by kicking out these defective or poorly functioning cells. We've also been able to show that this cell competition process stops pancreatic cancer from starting. And so it protects the, the tissue against disease. And we've also identified a very important signal that allows mutant cells to be detected by the normal cells. And this signal is essential to trigger this kicking out process from the tissue. So what we've discovered is that cancer causing cells don't just start dividing and growing uncontrollably in the tissue as we'd previously thought, but they first need to compete with the normal cells to stay in the tissue and survive. 
So this leads us to a little bit of a, of a paradox because how do we then get tumors? Because we know that pancreatic tumors carry cells that carry these RAS mutations. So they must be able to stay in the tissue at some point and then grow and divide on, uh, and to form a tumor. And what we've discovered actually is that this kicking out process is not very good. It's sometimes it fails to happen. And we're trying to understand the reasons why this uh, uh, system isn't very effective all of the time. But certainly we can imagine that if there is an external stress, so for example, potentially there's some inflammation in the tissue, then that can uh, tip the balance of competition in favor of the mutant cells. So now they are no longer kicked out of the tissue and maybe then they can also expand and grow uh, much more effectively in that environment. And other research has shown that these MRAS mutant cells can also take on a second genetic mutation. And this turns them into what we call super competitors. And super competitors can expand and grow in a tissue at the expense of the normal cells. So they do this essentially by killing off the normal cells. But whether this is actually a process in pancreatic cancer, we're not 100% sure yet, but it is something that we are investigating. So it may surprise you uh, to learn that uh, while uh, obesity is uh, considered the most major modifiable risk factor for pancreatic cancer, very little is actually known about its effect in the early stages of the disease. Therefore, we devised a project that would answer some of these questions. We used a in vivo pancreatic cancer model uh, that had been previously established uh, in Catherine's lab. And we applied a high fat diet uh, to this model, as well as applying a normal diet. Our hypothesis was that a high fat diet would prevent this uh, kicking out process that Catherine just described. It would cause these mutant cells to be retained in the tissue. Uh, and we, we and we thought this could be a, a cause for this beginnings of um, cancer initiation. So that's the first question we wanted to ask. But the second question that we wanted to ask is, what is the effect of, of, of um, well, this application of the high fat diet on the very, very early stages of disease, but past this kicking out process? Does a, does a high fat diet cause an increase in the initiation of cancer? And does it also cause an increase in the progression of cancer? These were two questions that we wanted to ask. We've, we asked these questions. A, a really nice characteristic of the model is that the mutant cells also express this red fluorescence protein, as you can see from the two images on the side here. We can use this fluorescence protein to distinguish between the uh, normal cells and the mutant cells and then with additional um, staining techniques uh, on top of this, uh, we can look at the characteristics between these two populations and how they interact with each other. This fluorescence process is the cornerstone of what we do as a lab because it gives us an opportunity to understand uh, the, the specific uh, interactions between the normal and mutant cells. However, what we realized is that we could uh, expand upon this further. Therefore, we uh, as a lab have pioneered the uh, use of 3D imaging in, uh, in the pancreas at Cardiff University. We do this through a process called flash tissue clearing. It's a process by which we remove the color from tissue. We can then um, clear it, make it become invisible through the use of a series of uh, chemicals. And then we can do the similar immuno uh, fluorescent staining that, that we just showed previously. And as you can see from uh, from these these videos, we can take whole tissue sections. So this is uh, a third of the amount of tissue that we would expect to get from our model. We can we can stain it and we can image it using high resolution microscopes so that we preserve a high level of detail despite imaging uh, so much of the uh, so much tissue and we can then analyze this tissue uh, in three dimensions imaging in three dimensions it provides a a whole new world almost of opportunities to understand the the interactions between normal and mutant cells 
in these examples here, uh, we looked at the network of ducts within the pancreas and their relationship with uh, the mutant cells present. 3D imaging allows us to uh, provide additional context to our, uh, our studies and draw more meaningful conclusions. So thus far, our work has highlighted that not only obesity, but also um, aging prevent this kicking out process of, um, of mutant cells. And this makes sense because um, aging is the most major risk factor um, in pancreatic cancer. So it kind of goes back to what Catherine was saying about this idea that risk factors are, are, are causing retention of these cells. We also observed that application of high-fat diet uh, does not appear to increase the incidence of the disease, so the initiation of the disease. However, it does impact the speed of progression of, uh, of the, the cancer. And we're now uh, working to kind of understand what the reasons behind that. So our work is ongoing to identify the reasons behind the loss uh, of this protective tissue clearance process. Uh, and we hope that uh, this work will lead to the identification of um, novel biomarkers for uh, both at-risk and early disease um, stages. And this will make early diagnosis uh, easier and more frequent. So finally, why is our research important? Why is it important to understand this process? Well, firstly, we need to understand the mechanisms underpinning how this cell competition process works in the pancreas tissue. And that will allow us to then determine why it fails and when it fails during disease processes. So from this, we may be able to predict when, where or how competition mechanisms fail. And this will allow us to be able to detect the at risk and the early pre-malignant cancer lesions that grow in tissues at earlier time points. So early detection is fundamental to improving um, outcomes for people who are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. But we have very little understanding of the biology or our understanding of the biology is quite poor. So early detection really relies on new research into the biology of early disease. By understanding also how competition works, we can then question, well, how risk factors such as high fat diet, as Josh has done, but other risk factors like tissue aging, for example, um, how these then impact on the health of disease and the ability for tissues, sorry, the health of the tissue and how tissues can kick cells out. And that will really um, inform cancer prevention, for example. But it could also lead to the development of therapeutics that could boost the tissue health to ensure that healthy tissue stays for longer and that our tissues are able to get rid of these cancer causing cells more often and prevent tumors from starting. So finally, I'd like to give a very special thanks to AMSA Just in Time. AMSA Just in Time are a pancreatic cancer charity in Wales that have been financially supporting our research since 2014, so for 10 years now. And we're hugely grateful to the fact that they have invested in our research. Their investment has helped us establish Pancreatic Cancer Research Programme at Cardiff University and in Wales. And this has had a number of knock-on effects that are really positive. Firstly, it has helped us attract external funding uh, from uh, funders such as Pancreatic Cancer UK, but also Cancer Research UK. It has also helped us attract um, research partnerships to be able to develop new uh, projects and go in different directions, both at Cardiff University, but also within the UK. And together with these new partnerships, we're working towards developing new early detection tools, but also new therapeutics that could target pancreatic cancer sooner. And finally, the investment into our pancreatic cancer research program has also allowed us to train um, and uh, mentor the next generation of pancreatic cancer researchers such as Josh. Um, and this wouldn't have been possible without AMSA just in time uh, fun funding. So we're very grateful, Diakonvar, uh, Ashan and AMSA just in time. And thank you very much for your attention this evening. Happy to take questions. That's great. Thank you so much for that. The, the language of cell biology there is fascinating, isn't it? RAS mutations, loser cells, um, super competitors, 
flash tissue clearing um, and the 3D imaging stuff is incredible. Um, so I have some uh, pre-submitted questions and I'll start with those if I may, and then I'll box and cox on the, um, on the other questions as they come in. So please do uh, feed the Q&A button, as I said earlier, um, so that we have a, a good discussion from now till, till six o'clock. Um, Catherine and, and Josh, um, you mentioned that it's an adult disease. Um, and you mentioned that aging is obviously one factor, obesity another. Um, why is it, is it only an adult disease, as it were? Yeah, it, so yes, it's a, it, it, I mean, cancer fundamentally is a, is a disease of aging. Um, so predominantly pancreatic cancer is a, uh, is a disease that occurs not just in adulthood, but in later adulthood. So, um, Statistics on ages of, of, um, of uh, disease incidence is uh, more into 60s and 70s, but we know that the, the disease does take a, a long time to develop. So it, from the, the point of, uh, of diagnosis, it, the disease could have been developing maybe 10, 20 years previously. Um, so it's, it's a, quite a lifetime disease. It takes a, a while for it to develop, uh, but it is developing at... Um, early stages but yes it is a, a adult disease yeah i see thank you and then um that idea you you touched on uh, breakthroughs that are likely to come um in your final couple of slides there there's a question here uh you know with a with a very um meaningful first sentence here pancreatic cancer is always devastating news what do you think will be the research breakthroughs for this cancer that will start to save lives? I mean, what 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 kind of timescale? I know it's you know invidious to to pin anybody down on that, but what do you think? You're, you're talking about identification of biomarkers, and but what's the what's the chronology as you see it from you know the centre of research at Cardiff? Yeah, I'm happy to take that question. I mean, I think first of all, I would say that. You know, I, I started to research pancreatic cancer in 2013, and the statistics were slightly grimmer than they are now. So even within 10 years, the survival rate has it, it's very slow and it's a very small step, but it is moving towards that 10 percent five year survival rate, uh, where whereas before it was below five percent. And I think that what has made that happen is more research. So the mm. research community has moved more towards looking at pancreatic cancer, which was very understudied up to this point. And funders are investing more into pancreatic cancer research. So with more research, we have more, you know, more chances of actually um, treating these terrible diseases. I think with breakthroughs, there's a you know, huge push to, for new therapeutics. Um, the most exciting is these uh, drugs that are now targeting the RAS protein itself. Mm -hmm. So for, for decades, we've known that RAS causes cancer, but and for decades, it's been deemed to be undruggable. Um, mm -hmm. But there's been a major breakthrough in that in the last 12, 18 months coming from the US where people have developed uh, drugs that are targeting RAS. And I think that's going to have a huge impact on pancreatic cancer therapies. Um, but I think from our perspective, early detection is, is really urgently needed because ur early detection impacts also on the way clinical trials can be designed, for example, um, because sadly, many people who are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer are very unwell. And so mm. putting them through a clinical trial can be very difficult. And that means you've got very low numbers of recruitment to trials, et cetera. So having early detection tools means that potentially we can catch people earlier at stages where an operation, for example, will make um, will have a benefit, but we'll also be able to design better clinical trials. OK, that's really clear. Thanks, Catherine. Um, an interesting one, this one. Uh, a friend of one member of the audience has very unfortunately been diagnosed with stage four. Um, his doctor, interestingly, in uh, is located in Australia and has suggested the use of pips from fruit. Does that ring a bell? Is there any biomedical basis for that? I would say we're, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't personally have the, have the enough information to be able to give a, a proper answer on that one. Um, yeah. 
you know, it's a quite it's quite a tricky one because the pancreas is so important to digestion. And so I think we don't fully understand how that really fits then with with the disease as well. Mm. Um, so it's early days, I would say, but how diet is affecting pancreatic cancer. Um, mm. Potentially, I mean, there's some new research coming out that shows that diet can also affect how um, people respond to chemotherapy. So, you know, I think this is a really fast moving space and we we will have a lot more information in the next few years because it's becoming much more. Um, I think the research community is becoming much more aware of the fact that this is something we need to look at, like diet, for example. See, and there's another question here about specific foods to avoid. I mean, a high fat diet would not be a good idea, clearly, for all sorts of reasons. But there's more work, you say, to be done in relation to the, the, the dietary links with, with pancreatic cancer. Is that right? OK. Yeah, yeah I think so. Um, any hereditary um, links here or is it lifestyle environmental? So that's quite an interesting question because biologically we, we we can't observe hereditary links but we know that there is an increased risk of of uh, developing the disease if a family member has previously had it right but um i think uh, a lot of research currently and a lot of the, the research direction is going uh, into this idea of lifestyle and diet having an effect uh, on uh, developing the disease and and how aggressive the disease is as well so as Catherine said, I think it's such an exciting and emerging field of research, and uh, we're just scratching the surface now of the effects. Interesting. Okay. Um, interesting question here about um, ethnicity. Um, is there are there any links here disproportionately to some ethnic groups? Um, I I don't think so. Actually, I think the prevalence is probably higher in the Western world. Mm -hmm. um, and that's very largely likely to do with Western diets, um, mm -hmm. even though we're still, as Josh mentioned, we're still scratching on the surface of that. Um, but yeah, those 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 links haven't been made, actually. Yeah. OK. Um, any link between, here's another question, pancreatic cancer and diabetes of either type? So um, there is a link between um, pancreatic cancer and um type 2 diabetes mm. although um this this could be because of factors in causing the type 2 diabetes there hasn't been um much in the way of a link between uh pancreatic cancer and type 1 diabetes though so um in, in type 2 diabetes um there appears to be yes but type 1 diabetes uh, no research is suggesting that at the minute no interesting okay that is interesting um any link here, any benefits, any learnings um, for other types of cancer um, that you would be able to contribute to? So what's, you know, what are the links between breakthroughs and insights in, in your field and um, others working on other types of cancer? Yeah, so I, I'm happy to take that question. So I think from a general perspective, <clears throat> so our research um, certainly aligns with research from other labs both in the UK and around the world that have shown that um, tissues, all of our tissues can kick out mutant cells. So yeah. that's been shown for the skin, it's been shown for the, the esophagus, which is basically your, your food pipe. Um, uh, it's been shown for the liver, for example. Um, so that seems to be a, uh, a mechanism that really most tissues are using to try and make sure they stay healthy for longer. So, so we're contributing to that in, in that sense. And potentially there's some overlap in the mechanisms that are um, that tissues use to kick out these mutant cells. Um, we're also looking at how it happens in or how it works in the lung because uh, KRAS mutations or RAS mutations are also associated with a third of um, lung cancers, lung adenocarcinomas. So um, we also have a project running in the lab, which we're, we're hoping to publish soon um, on RAS mutant cells and how they have to compete and stay in tissues in, in lungs. So potentially there could be some overlap there too. And for sure, there must be some common mechanism somewhere. Yeah, we, we're just working to identify those. Okay, good. 
lots of questions coming in on exactly what um, you're saying around around diet and, and which aspects of um, a high fat diet we we mean. Is it is it, it where, are we talking about the fats we all know we should avoid the trans fats, not the good fats as it were, and are we also to avoid high sugar for this particular risk? I mean, we we should be avoiding that anyway. But you, you see what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I think it's important to say an issue that we're not nutritionists. So I think if the understanding from the research is that the um, the unsaturated and polyunsaturated fats are the um, are the most dangerous types, and a good ratio between your omega six and your omega three fats is is also crucial. But beyond that, I think the um, the most important thing is a, is like a, a balanced, a healthy balanced diet. I think with a healthy balanced diet, you're you're doing everything you can to uh, avoid obesity and and diet related risk factors, especially in pancreatic cancer. In, in terms of sugar, there's not been much research into um, the effects of a high sugar diet on this specific uh, process, or and uh, this is, I think where the field will inevitably go is the effects of different types of diets on mm. uh, on the disease and understanding specifically the um the 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 diet characteristics that affect um cancer uh, but currently we we don't have those answers okay and there's a question here also about vegan and plant-based diets um what are the tips or techniques to incorporate um for those with a, a vegan and plant-based diet I think, again, I think it's a, having a healthy, balanced yeah. diet, I think, is the most important thing. And that's what that's what the research su suggests currently. So that's mm -hmm. the advice that I suppose we can give, yeah. um, just uh, ensuring you have a healthy, balanced diet. Yeah. Um, aware also, as you quite rightly said, that you're not nutritionists. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think we can we can we probably could safely say as well that I, it's quite complicated, you know, mm -hmm. so I think it's. um you know the assumption would be that it's the fats but uh the evidence evidence from other studies suggests that it's not just the fats so it's a, a sense of um and actually from the human data it's the bmi so having a high bmi is the risk so not necessarily having the fat but having the high bmi but to to model high bmi in the lab we have to use a high fat diet and that's kind of our our way of doing it yeah, yeah. Um, so, the, so it's quite, I think it's still very complicated. We're still, uh, you know, trying to unpick that. Um, and I think the other thing that's really starting to emerge quite rapidly from the field in general is, is the role of the microbiome. Um, and of course, everything we eat affects the microbiome. Mm. And how that's playing a role in pancreas is really a new frontier. Um, right. but quite an exciting one. So, yeah. And by, by the microbiome, do you mean the healthy gut? Healthy gut, yeah, 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 Good. yeah. Um, that's the extent of my technical knowledge. Um, and <laughs> you, you mentioned technical. I mentioned te technical questions. Josh, did you know that your brother is in the audience? <laughs> I'm. I I was made aware today. Yes, You're made aware. Okay. Well, you he's plant. You either you've planted it or um, <laughs> he is he is uh, being cheeky here. But I will. Uh, I will. Nathan, I will read yours out. It's a good question. Technical question, Nathan says, um, who announces himself as your brother, Josh, so it's all very transparent. For earlier pancreatic cancer diagnosis, are you trying to improve biomarking so that you can try and identify a significant difference between RAS GTP and RAS GDP? Or are the biomarkers more towards other substances that are found commonly with the development of pancreatic cancer? So that's that's a really good question. I would say that generally uh, the biomarkers I think that we're seeking are more separate from the RAS. I think we're looking more at the the effect of the early stages of disease and can we detect the effect that it's having on the on the uh, external healthy tissue uh, and use this to identify the the presence of the, of the disease. So I'd say. Yeah, it's about external factors beyond the RAS, um, the changes in the RAS, uh, as opposed to looking specifically at the proportions of uh, RAS uh, GTP and RAS GDP. Okay, hope that helps, Nathan. You've got a lifetime with Josh to ask if you didn't. <laughs> um, 
a couple more questions uh, we have time for. Um, it, this is an interesting one. You mentioned it right at the beginning, um, Josh and Catherine. Early um, signs are difficult um, to gauge, you know, to get, get it, uh, getting it early because there are very few symptoms early on. One question, why so? Um, and what are the earliest, if you like, detection symptoms that one should be looking out for? Uh, you mentioned very, very interestingly that it's in emergency situations that it's often first, first found. So why no symptoms? What are the early symptoms? Um, so the reason the reason for the lack of early symptoms or specific early symptoms is because the symptoms that you you develop are are, are quite gener generic. So, for example, uh, abdominal pain is a um, it's a symptom that's associated with quite a range of diseases, and pancreatic cancer is not necessarily at the top of the list of diseases that would. Um, that, that, that you would suspect the, the, the patients of having. Um, so it takes a, a long time for a, a, enough symptoms to develop that point you in the direction of pancreatic cancer. And by this time, it's, um, it's at a late stage. So it's not necessarily the, it, it, it is symptomless early stages, but once you get the onset of symptoms, they are not specific enough to signal pancreatic cancer at a stage at which the disease is eminently treatable so that's yes, right got you yeah um, i think it's worth saying as well that um you know this is where early detection comes in too because we don't have a blood test for for detecting pancreatic cancer in at the gp for example right. um and many diagnosis comes with ultrasound you know so and as josh uh, rightly said that by that stage, you know, things have developed quite far because potentially somebody has had a very vague symptom for a very long time. Mm. Um, so what we need is is a blood test, really, or or some kind of um, yeah test that 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 could be done at at a GP surgery that would right. rule in you know rule out a, a cancer diagnosis as well as ruling in a cancer diagnosis. That's right. That's so, right. Yeah. yeah. It's also. Sorry, it's also important to say that um, Pancreatic Cancer UK have a lot of really great leaflets um, yeah. for this sort of these sorts of questions as well. So, if for anybody who's concerned, there's loads of really amazing resources out there for um, understanding the symptoms of pancreatic cancer, and um, yeah, those are eminently available on the internet. That's a really good um, reminder. Thanks, Josh. Um, one final question. It is for Josh. It's a lovely question to end with. And Josh, if you could keep this one brief, it's a big question though. Um, um, and very nicely phrased here. Josh, you're a PhD student at the start of your science career. What are your ambitions? Oh, that's a uh, that's that's a big question. Um, I've, I've been very lucky to learn from Catherine and to get the best uh, education at Cardiff. So I want to take everything that I've learned here and I want to help the scientific community with the, the techniques and the expertise and the uh, sound scientific process that I've, I've learned. So it's just to improve the outcomes for patients, I would say, is my uh, my aims. And that's eloquently put. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Um, unfortunately, folks, we're out of time today. Catherine, Josh, Dielch, thank you so much for your presentations and the discussion afterwards. We kept you um, on your toes with the questions. Um, if we didn't get a chance to, to uh, answer your specific question, we will, as I said earlier, follow up with you directly on that. Um, so you will receive an email in the next few days with a copy of the recording. I mentioned that at the beginning as well. Feel free to share that and with links to register for future events um, in the series as well. Um, importantly, and we'll end here, if anybody watching would like to get involved with, uh, with this kind of research that Josh has just outlined there, and that Catherine so ably leads there, volunteering time to help our students or helping to fundraise for our research, exactly this impactful research you've heard about. Please follow the link in the comments box on screen now. Diolch o gawn eich hynna chi hynna a ran y brifysgol a'r siaradwyr on behalf of the university and the speakers this evening. Diolch o gawn eich hynna chi. Thank you. Good evening. <laughs>